So one of these days I'm going to walk in from the back just so I can sit and listen to the conversations probably about me uh, before I before I start oh my god <laughs> really uh, are you are you commenting on my comment or the complaints about the temperature in here I find it delightful no I, I, I don't mind it at all no I'm commenting on on, on you suggesting that every conversation is about you. That was, uh, that was uh, um, uh, ironic at best, I think. Uh, let me get started. Uh, as we have made clear from the outset of the Biden-Harris administration, ASEAN is at the heart of our U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. We are committed to ASEAN's centrality, and our partnership is critical to maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific region. We continue to partner with ASEAN and its members to advance issues that matter most to our combined one billion people, including building an inclusive digital economy, addressing the climate crisis, accelerating the clean energy transition, and enhancing maritime security, to name just a few. To further strengthen our critical partnerships in Southeast Asia, Secretary Blinken will be traveling to Vientiane tonight to represent the United States at the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN UN su US Summit. This will be the Secretary's second trip to VNTN this year and his 19th trip to the Indo-Pacific region during this administration. During these meetings, the Secretary will reiterate the United States' commitment to ASEAN centrality and highlight how the U.S.-ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership is delivering concrete benefits for our combined one billion people. The Secretary will further discuss geopolitical issues, including the ongoing crisis in Burma, the importance of upholding international law in the South China Sea, and, pe and peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, and Russia's aggression against Ukraine. At the same time, Secretary Blinken will affirm U.S. support for the Lao PDR ASEAN Chair Year and commitment to further strengthening U.S.-Lao PDR Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. This morning, the White House announced that given the, pro the projected trajectory and strength of Hurricane Milton, President Biden is postponing his upcoming trip to Germany and Angola in order to oversee preparations for and the response to Hurricane Milton, in addition to the ongoing response to the impacts of Hurricane Helene across the Southeast. Secretary Biden was planning to join the President in Germany and Angola, but given this postponement, will now expects to return home to Washington from Laos. With that, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'll just start on logistics at the, at the top. Uh, during these meetings in VNTN, what, which meetings are those? So the meetings that he, he will have both with, um, which some are, which, and bilateral meetings, which, which we'll announce we will announce in the coming days. We're, not, we're firming up the schedule still, but we'll announce them uh, as we usually do um, in the schedule the day, before, uh, the, day before, uh, the day before they occur. Okay, and then this is just kind of a minor point, but uh, you, ASEAN is at the heart of U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, and I here I had think been thinking that the U.S.-Japan alliance was the cornerstone of the U.S. Indo-Pacific. They are both critical strategy. alliances and partnerships for the United and States. And the Quad, also critical. Also critical. One of the things you've heard the Secretary talk about the most is that we've been able to both rebuild our diplomatic alliances mm -hmm. and forge new alliances like the Quad okay. during this administration. And the U.S.-South Korea alliance. What's that? Uh, also a critical, important alliance to. So Peace they're all, in, they can't all be at the heart of, they can't all be It's a big heart. We have, I mean, we have a big you heart. You have Matt. four <laughs> cornerstones, okay? <laughs> right. um, this has nothing to do with travel, but, uh, or at least the Secretary's travel, but I just wanted to get, before we get into the Middle East, uh, an update if you have one on the Lebanon flights. Uh, I do. So um, another flight left, another U.S. organized flight left from Beirut this morning for Istanbul. Uh, it had approximately 120 uh, U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents, and their family members on board. That brings uh, the total number of U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents, and family members who have left on U.S. organized flights since we started them last week to over 1,000 uh, on 10 flights. We've had 10 flights go out, each with a capacity of 300 people, total of 3,000 seats that we've made available on these flights, uh, been filled so far by over 1,000 uh, people. In addition, uh, with flights that have gone out on Middle East Airways, uh, Middle East Airlines, we have now blocked over 900 seats, and uh, we know that hundreds of them have been filled by uh, Americans as well. All right. So 10, 10 flights, 3,000 seats, only one, a third of them have been filled. Correct. Correct. My understanding is that there was one flight that left maybe last night that only had like 
19 people on it Some, it somewhere around that yeah the, the flight so last night I, they, they varied last night was a, 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 so, a very it, small number of people but today we had as I said yeah, uh, okay. about but, around 120 people fair enough but I'm just I'm just wondering since you've said that you're going to keep organizing these flights for as long as there's demand at what point does the demand what we'll point is demand so diminished that you think that you don't need to do them anymore? Uh, when we when we get to a point that there is uh, is well, let me tell you how we would generally look at it. If we get to a point where there is sufficient capacity on commercial flights that don't require us to organize these U.S. charter flights, then we would stop organizing them. We started organizing them because there wasn't sufficient capacity on the only airline that was um, leaving from Beirut, even though we were able to hold seats for U.S. citizens. There weren't enough for the demand. So um, uh, we've supplemented that with our own flights. If at some point we find that there's not enough demand uh, and that the demand that exists can be filled with commercials, we would take a look at, right. at moving back to just uh, operating commercial flights. But we don't assess we're at that point yet. And demand does shift over time based on the security situation. Yep. There's still a number of Americans who are in contact with us about wanting to leave. And so for the time being, we're going to continue these How flights. How many is that? Uh, there are, so not, it's not an answer to that question. There are 8,800 well, 8, people who are in contact with the United States, uh, with the State Department, looking for more information. Some percentage of those. It's not 100%. Some percentage of those 8,800 are looking for information about leaving, and some lesser percentage of those ultimately haven't decided to leave yet, as, as witnessed by the number of seats that aren't filled. But they're looking for information because, as we've said before, they make assessments all the time based on the security situation and based on um, their indivi individual situations inside Lebanon. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matt. Today, there is report since now in Israel that Netanyahu ordered Gallant not to travel to Washington, D.C., and this also comes with reports inside Israel that the, the ongoing uh, cabinet uh, uh, meetings finalizing the re Israeli respond to Iran. Do you see that the cancellation of Gallant's visit as a sign of imminent Israeli respond or not? So I wouldn't want to characterize it all. Ultimately, decisions about um, m members of the Israeli cabinet traveling to and from Washington are decisions for the government of Israel to make. Um, so I wouldn't want to characterize that at all. Uh, um, and uh, in, in Lebanon as well, uh, the Deputy uh, General Secretary of Hezbollah, Naim Qasim, today <coughs> announced that he supports the efforts by the Speaker of the Parliament, Nabi Hiberi, and other political leaders to reach and a diplomatic solution to this conflict based on the uh, on the proposal by the United States and others of 21 days ceasefire. Uh, do, do you see that this proposal that and this efforts now, diplomatic efforts in Lebanon, has any feasibility to succeed or considering what's going on on the ground? I mean, 105 missiles today have been fired onto Israel, fighting still going on in the south. Uh, a few things about that. For, so first of all, I did see these reports that Hezbollah now wants a ceasefire. and Delinked from Gaza. Yeah, delinked from Gaza. That they, they just want a ceasefire on its own terms. And I think my initial response to this is, where have they been for a year? For a year, the world has been calling on Hezbollah to stop the attacks across the border into Israel. And for a year, Hezbollah said they would not do it unless there was a ceasefire in Gaza. They linked the two when the international community was saying, stop the fighting. And Israel was saying, if Hezbollah stopped attacks across the border, Israel would stop its attacks in response against Hezbollah. So for a year, you had the world calling for this ceasefire. You had Hezbollah refusing to agree to one. And now that Hezbollah is on the back foot and is getting battered, battered suddenly they've changed their tune and want a ceasefire. Um, I think it's not surprising given the situation they find themselves in. Uh, we continue to ultimately want a diplomatic solution to this conflict, but as you've heard, heard me say for the past several days, Hezbollah's forces in southern Lebanon refused to fully implement United Nations Security Council 1701. Under the terms of that resolution, Hezbollah was supposed to put down its arms and it was supposed to withdraw beyond the Latani River. And over the 18 years since that resolution was implemented, they refused to do either of those things. In so, fact, not only did they refuse to do them, they increased their arms 
uh, just over the border from Lebanon, and they increased the number of forces just over, over, over the border from Israel, not over the border from Lebanon, obviously. So, uh, so, so, let me, yeah, say, sure. so, so we support Israel's efforts to degrade Hezbollah's capability, but yes, ultimately, we do want to see a diplomatic resolution to this conflict. We believe that is ultimately the only resolution that will provide real lasting security to both the Israeli and Leb Lebanese people. So, I mean, correct me if I understand you wrong. If you're, what you are saying is, yes, there will be, we are ultimately want a, a diplomatic solution to stop this war, but it's uh, not yet now. We need want to give a window for Israel to attack Hezbollah more. I think there is a question. So, the I think there is a real question of, Trust isn't even the right word. I was going to say, so has, uh, it's trust, but obviously we don't trust Hezbollah. But you look at, you look at what Hezbollah said in 2006 when 1701 was adopted by the UN Security Council, and Hezbollah said that they would implement 1701, and they blew through all of their commitments. And so there is an obvious lack of faith in Hezbollah's ability to do what it said in 2006 and do what it's saying it would do now, which is agree to an actual ceasefire that would allow Israeli civilians to return home and allow Lebanese civilians to return home. So the answer to your question is yes, we do support Israel um, uh, launching these uh, uh, incursions to degrade Hezbollah's infrastructure, so ultimately we can get a diplomatic resolution that allows 1701 to finally be fully implemented. And she also today spoke directly to the Lebanese people as leading with them to take this opportunity to take their country back, I mean, I'm quoting here. And some inside Lebanon are afraid of this uh, uh, conflict to spill into another civil war in Lebanon. Do, do you see that maybe this kind of rhetoric from Israel is pushing Lebanon toward more inner fighting rather than fighting in the South? So I'm not going to comment on, on the Prime Minister's statement. Um, I will just state our position when it comes to Lebanon. What we want to see come out of this uh, situation ultimately is Lebanon able to break the grip that Hezbollah has had on the country. More than a grip, break the stranglehold that Hezbollah has had on the country. And remove um, Hezbollah's veto over a president, which has kept the country in a political stalemate for two years and kept it from moving forward in electing a president and remove Hezbollah's ability to um, block the state from being the sole uh, entity that can exercise force in southern Lebanon. Because that's ultimately what has kept 1701 from being implemented, is that UNIFIL and the LAF can't properly do their job because Hezbollah won't move back and won't disarm. So that is the ultimate outcome that we want to see from this conflict. And obviously, we do not want to see any kind of instability in inside Lebanon. And the, the, I think the premise of your question, it's not the premise of your question, but one of the possible outcomes of your question would be because Hezbollah decides to resist pulling back and resist a, the Lebanese armed forces and UNIFIL doing the job that they're supposed to do under 1701. My last question, a simple yeah, sure. one. I asked, I asked her before, but I have to repeat it now. Uh, oil industries in Iran and nuclear facilities in Iran, <clears throat> are they still legitimate? Uh, targets for Israel. You know, the president has spoken to both of those, and I don't have anything to add to his comments. Just, just to come back, <clears throat> come back to that question. Uh, I know you said you won't comment on the um, Netanyahu's statement, but this idea of uh, this being an opportunity uh, for, for for Lebanon, for Lebanese people, that, and you know, it's been a long-standing position that you wanted to, uh, you would like to see a new, um, or the, the the hold over the new president lifted. But does the U.S. see this as an opportunity to the, the the current state of Hezbollah as an opportunity to kind of to get something you've wanted for a while, which is the, a change of the uh, a new regime in Lebanon? So it's not a question of a new regime. I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's a question of a new president because they don't have a, a a president now. It's not a question of picking sides inside Lebanon. Ultimately, it's an opportunity for the Lebanese people. What we have always wanted is for the Lebanese people to be able to choose their leaders, to be able to choose their government um, without a terrorist organization holding a veto uh, over that process and without a terrorist organization that wields force independent of the state. And so that's what 1701 called for. That's what we've wanted to see implemented for some time, yes. And 
we do hope that out of this conflict, there's an opportunity for the Lebanese people to exercise control over their country. All the all the the various um, uh, sectors of the Lebanese people to have a voice in what their country looks like, and not be held hostage to an armed terrorist terrorist there, group. There seems to be a contradiction between two weeks ago you were proposing a three week ceasefire. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the calls for the for the Israelis, well, for all sides, not to not to escalate. The Israelis have escalated, and now you're saying it's an opportunity for the Lebanese people. So I, I guess people might see that as disingenuous that you're you're kind of uh, you're kind of happy with this outcome. So our position on what we what they just say our posi underlying position on what we want to see for the Lebanese people has been consistent since the outset of this administration. It's a position I just went through, the ability to elect a new president, the ability to, to break uh, the stalemate that Hezbollah has had over the country. And our position remains that we want to see an ultimate diplomatic resolution to this conflict. But the situation on the ground has changed over the past few weeks. And Hezbollah's leadership has been degraded. Hezbollah's uh, infrastructure has been degraded. It's lost a number of, of members of its command and control. It's lost uh, uh, some percentage of its arms, its missiles, its rockets. And so the situation on the ground has changed. And so what we want to see come out of this new situation is the ultimate Res, uh, implementation of 1701. And it's just a, and I'll just be, I mean, just be very candid. It is a different it is a different world you're looking at today than it was several weeks ago. So we wanted to see 1701 implemented seven, uh, several weeks ago. That's been our position. It's been the position of the United States going back to 2006 when it was implemented. But it is a very different situation now when several weeks ago that would require Hezbollah at the height of its power to decide to pull back from the border to increase security. And Hezbollah today, which has been significantly degraded, and now finds itself on, back, on the back foot, made clear by the statement they made today calling for a ceasefire for the first time. And uh, I, yeah, I think um, you've been saying, you know, you support the idea of a, a limited incursion by the Israelis in, in southern Lebanon. Um, but uh, I guess as we've seen, that as the facts on the ground change, you, your position basically seems to be, um, okay, we're okay with the new, with the new normal. So if this uh, limited incursion starts to last for longer, um, are you, at what point will you basically not be okay with the continued operation which, which becomes uh, an invasion or an occupation? So I'm not going to deal with hypotheticals, but the answer to that question is we want to see the implementation of 1701. And what 1701 calls for is Israeli troops back on the Israeli side of the border, Hezbollah pulled back beyond the Latani River, and the Lebanese armed forces and UNIFIL exercising security control over southern Lebanon. Matt, sorry, yeah. just given that Hezbollah, are, someone in Hezbollah is now saying they, you know, they're open to a ceasefire. Are the Israelis calling for a ceasefire? No, they are not. And so we know that you've said repeatedly it takes two to tango when it comes to ceasefire. Is this not a good starting point? That, as you say, Hezbollah is being degraded. At one point, at what point is it significantly degraded enough for for the U.S. to say, "Okay, enough is enough. We've got something to start off with here." Like, are you talking about supporting Israel to the point of removing Hezbollah entirely, I, or I, I, like, is, there's, there's got to be some end point in which you guys are working with? And if that's something you can't talk to us about now, then okay. But like, this is we're going to keep asking you. I, no, I fully, I fully understand, and I will offer you assessments about where things stand on the ground at any given moment, and that ultimately impacts, of course, um, uh, where we will be. Though it doesn't change our long-term policy that we want to see. It may in impact what we want to see happen on any given day, but our long-term policy remains the same. Our long-term policy is we want to see. 1701 fully implemented, as I said, in, respo in response that? to Simon's question. Who, who makes that move first? The, so it's not a question of first. Ultimately, all the parties would have to come together, and the United States would look to play a role in that, as we would look to other partners in the region and around the world. And those are the conversations we've been having with our partners in the region and around the world over the past few days, which is how you get to full implementation of 1701. What's happening right now is, I'm uh, sorry, uh, just to give, what's happening right now is Israel is degrading significantly degrading in some ways Hezbollah's military capabilities. And I think the, the fact that they came out and called for a ceasefire today shows that Hezbollah knows it's on the back foot, knows its, its capabilities are being degraded. And so the reason it's hard to answer the question is, 
is Hezbollah calling for a ceasefire, or is Hezbollah calling for a ceasefire and agreeing to pull back beyond the Latani River, which is something that they haven't said that they would do. That would be full implementation of 1701. And then the second question is, are they actually going to implement it, and um, uh, can the world trust, given the fact they've been degraded and unifil, and the LAF are in a position to enforce that, that Security Council resolution that we everyone can move forward with confidence? But if you don't, but my, my, because this is why I asked about the Israelis, that Hezbollah, they're not going to, it seems to me like they're not going to offer to do all of that if they don't see that there's, like you've been talking about with the other conflict in Gaza, that there's a political will. There is no will on the Israeli side to stop right now. And it appears that they have the support of the US to keep going until they degrade Hezbollah to a point of like, to what point? That's why that question is important. So for, like we've been asking about a red line at a what sure, point? And we've been asking about bombing of Beirut. Uh, at what point is there a point where you can... So we are having very direct conversations with the government of Israel about the shape and the nature and the ultimate scope of that campaign. But I also think it's not always productive for us to come out and talk about uh, the full details of those conversations in a public forum. They're ongoing, and we've made clear to them what we want to see the ultimate resolution, which is a diplomatic one with 1701 fully implemented. How we get there is something that we're in conversation with them about. So you, you think that calling for a ceasefire back on October, uh, or sorry, September 26th was short-sighted, premature, 25th, short-sighted, premature, but not not a, not a smart move? I'm not going to characterize it other than it was the, it was the conclusion of the United States and its partners uh, around the world that that was a path forward at the time. The, the situation, still, well, the situation okay. on the ground has changed, well, yes, but ultimately it doesn't change that we want to get to a diplomatic resolution. Well, fair enough, but it, it, it changed after you did you, Correct, you, correct. And that's, I'm, that's what I'm... It. And so you still, you, you don't think it was a mistake to propose that no. and push it? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, circling back to the canceled Golan trip, there are reports that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordered that he not come to the U.S. until Netanyahu has a chance to speak with President Biden. Is there any indication right now that the lack of communication between the heads of state is trickling down to other levels of government and preventing communication there? No, we have um, uh, conversations with the government of Israel on a number of levels, and the, those continue. And on Lebanon, I know you haven't set a red line publicly, but are you confident that Israel understands what the U.S. will and won't support when it comes to scope? of their operations there. Uh, we have been having, as I said, very direct conversations with them about that uh, exact question, and I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Say, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, you know, in your response to Shannon, or the substance of what she said about the relationship with Netanyahu and so on, I mean, there was, today, there was uh, um, uh, a leak, not a leak, but there was a report uh, on the new book by Bob uh, Woodward, and uh, the kind of you know, relations between the president and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, yesterday, um, the vice president was on 60 Minutes and so on. And the forensics of both uh, suggest that you don't really have a great deal of sway over uh, Netanyahu, despite the fact that we've given them, or taxpayers paid for, uh, almost $23 billion in the last year alone. That's almost $3,000 for each and every uh, Israeli. So we have, you have absolutely no leverage on, no pressure. You cannot tell them, do this or not do this. So we make very clear to the government of Israel what um, we believe that are the best outcomes along a number of different um, uh, vectors in the region. But as you've heard me say before, they're ultimately a sovereign country and have to make their own decisions. Yes, but I understand. But a sovereign country that received from American taxpayers that received $22 billion So first of all, that number, that number is not okay. correct. It, it Fine, conflates 17. a number of different things. I mean, but, know, no, but it's not, it's, sure. a, it's not correct. It's off. Okay, it conflates. Well, this, I was just, what is I, that? So what is I, I don't have the exact number, but okay. if you look at the, we'll I know there's another number you're referring to. I mean, you, uh, this so, is the number for, that came out of uh, yeah, which it well, comes, I mean, so, AP, there was I so what's the U.S. So, government? What, I don't, what does the U.S. government think I don't that have, it has given Israel since October 7th? So, I don't know. We give them $3.3 billion a year, and there was additional money that was appropriated yes. in the supplemental. The reason it's hard to ask that que answer that question definitively is but they're you different. Don't want to. They're, no, that's why. No, that's they're why diff it's hard to There are different ways of looking at it. There are money, there are, there's I've money that is appropriated, there's money that is allocated, and then not actually delivered for years to come. organizations, educational organizations, that have come up with estimates that have come up with estimates this building at least which is in charge of uh, arms transfers at least 
many of them, hasn't seen fit to come up with an update since July of last year. Yeah, I just don't have the update. I'm just telling you that number. Okay. Can, you can look at you can look at that number and see how it conflates a number of things, including direct U.S. military spending to combat the Houthis attacking international shipping, which is yeah. included in that number, but which is it obviously can't not be aid to that Israel. difficult to separate what has been uh, what has been given to them post October seventh uh, in terms of in terms of sure. in terms of things that were not approved before then. Under the MOU, stuff that went to them specifically for the Gaza operate and now Lebanon. So it's, it depends how you look at it. Is it the amount that's been allocated to them? Is it the amount that's been delivered to them? Is it the amount that is going to be delivered? I'll take any of them. No, right I know. Now. That's that's the point is when you ask the question, it's a difficult one. I don't have the numbers here at my fingertips, yeah. obviously. I'm just pointing out that the number that's cited. Well, someone's going to have the numbers someplace. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, Matt, I mean, the numbers were okay. yeah, uh, Brown University's numbers, not mine, and so on. But, you know, it doesn't matter what the, fi the actual figure is. But we give them a lot of money, we give them a great deal. Uh, of leverage, you know, they, we, we give them uh, obviously a great deal of uh, uh, political coverage in, in, the, in the UN and many other places and so on, and to suggest that, you know, uh, this huge and lengthy partnership really uh, does not exact any kind of leverage with the Israelis. Don't you question that? That's not what I said. The, th yeah. uh, the thing that I said is that we are a sovereign country with our interests, right. they are a sovereign country with their interests. Right. Okay. We make our we have very direct conversations with them about what we think the appropriate path forward is, but ultimately, like every sovereign country, they have to make their own decisions. They have to bear the consequences for those decisions. They have to carry the risks of those decisions. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, just not to belabor the issue, but uh, uh, let me ask you, do you believe that this money was well spent in the area that in which it was spent? You know, despite, no matter what the amount is. I mean, it, it, was it spent the, properly? Was it... Could it have been, you know, leveraged differently and so on? I don't know what you mean by the, okay. by the questions. Fine, I... never mind. And, uh, let me just ask you a couple of uh, other questions. The, uh, Pope Francis <laughs> slammed the, you know, the world as being uh, shameful, uh, shameful inability to, to bring about a ceasefire in Gaza. Do you agree with the Pope or do you think that the U.S. has done everything possible I to bring about I, so a ceasefire so, in Gaza? So you were, I think, misquoting what the Pope said, just to be clear. But okay. I, will, I will tell you that... Right. We, a very dangerous thing. Yeah, no, ki no kidding, Saeed. I, I, I stand corrected if I did. I stand corrected Don't want to miss what Yeah, for, yeah. For, that's for, what he said. For sure. Yeah. I, I will say we have worked tirelessly to bring about a ceasefire uh, to the war in Gaza. It is far past time that one be agreed to by both okay. parties. All right, let me just, you know, a couple more, uh, bear with me. Uh, Hamas military spokesman uh, said that uh, Israel could have basically had the hostages released way back, you know, last October or last November and so on. Do you think there was a missed opportunity to do that? Uh, I'll say that is a gross, uh, that is a gross revision of the actual history. Mm -hmm. I can tell you back in the negotiations to bring home all the hostages back November when we did get a one week yeah. pause, um, Hamas was in no way agreeing mm -hmm. to deliver all the hostages back to Israel. I'll leave it at that. Uh -huh. he, he would go ahead. To follow up on the questions, it takes two to tango. One uh, yesterday, when I was asking you about the ceasefire and what, if you are engaging with the Lebanese, you told me it's up to the Lebanese to step up or not. But you are the one that, who are conveying the messages or and supporting Israel. So the question now, you are asking them to implement the 1701 to send the the laugh to the south. They express will to do so. So at what step you are going to step up and, I don't know, mediation, uh, convey the messages to the Israeli that it's time to stop that? Are you waiting for some breakthrough on the ground more? So I'm not going to get into that publicly, as I said in the answer to Shannon's question. We were having conversations with, about that exact question with the government of Israel. I don't think it's appropriate for me to get into it uh, uh, publicly. We do, excuse me, we do support the limited ground incursions that they are um, uh, undertaking. Hezbollah is not, has not yet been removed from its positions all the way across the border. Hezbollah is still in a position in southern Lebanon to launch uh, attacks against Israel. And so it is, a, it, is a, it is a very fair question, and we are in conversation with it about it with the Israeli government, um, but I'm not going to get into that. So can for, I get it publicly. from here that you want Hezbollah to stop its attacks first? 
We have wanted Hezbollah to stop its attacks for a, over a year, well, a year going back today. It was, remember, it was October 8th when Hezbollah launched these attacks. Now, if at any point in that year, Hezbollah had agreed to what the international community called for, which is for it to stop its attacks and reach a diplomatic resolution, we would be in a very different situation now. And they wouldn't do it. As you recall, I, um, I said in response to another question, they throughout that time linked it to a ceasefire in Gaza and said without a ceasefire in Gaza, they were going to continue these attacks on uh, civilians inside Israel. So there was ample opportunity for a diplomatic resolution. There remains opportunity for a diplomatic resolution, and we're going to continue to push for one. But as I said, Hezbollah's forces are still deployed south of the Latani River. They're still launching rocket attacks against Israel from south of the Latani River. They're still in violation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. One final question on the limited version, because yesterday, uh, today, I don't know if you saw the video of the Israeli raising their flag on uh, in Maroon Ras. Do you think that this fall under the limited operation? Do you support that? I did see that. It's obviously inappropriate um, for uh, Israeli uh, uh, soldiers to take that step. Um, and uh, we would look th to them to comply with what they've said, which these are limited incursions, not with the goal of holding territory. Yeah, so, go ahead. Thanks for mentioning uh, that uh, you're evacuating uh, Americans through like uh, commercial airlines, but also the Israelis has been attacking the highway that leads to the airport, and it's the only way that you can arrive to the airport. And also you have thousands of Americans still live there and other nationalities as well. Uh, they might need to use uh, this kind of uh, like uh, transportation. Uh, did you talk to the Israelis that the airport is a red line? And We have made clear, I answered this question yesterday, we have made clear to uh, the government of Israel we want to see the airport open, and we want to see the roads to the airport open. Uh, both remain open. People are able to get to the airport to take both the U.S. organized flights that um, uh, we have put forward over the past week and the commercial uh, flights that continue to leave out of Beirut, and we want that we want it to stay that way. Are you having conversation with the uh, uh, Speaker of the House, Nabi Beirut, because he is the one can call for a session to elect a president? So he's the one that controlling this kind of uh, like doctrine. Are you speaking with him seriously? Because we had a visit from a foreign minister of Iran that wanted to Lebanon to stay as the same position, uh, relate the matter to Gaza and keep fighting to the yeah. end. And they're trying to block this. You said that Hezbollah is vetoing elected president. So now you have a friend that also is a friend of Hezbollah. Now everybody is a friend with you guys. And also Naim Qasim today, deputy of, of Hezbollah, called him an old, older brother. So are you, are you having a serious conversation with Speaker of the House, who is also vetoing at this moment uh, to call for member of parliaments to come and elect a president? So maybe in the next uh, period of time, he's going to be negotiating the, the land border, the, the more assistance, maybe yeah. the Lebanese army to help implement 1701. So we are having conversations with a number of uh, different um, players inside Lebanon, and not only are we having conversations with them, our allies and partners from inside the region and from outside the region are having those conversations, and oftentimes we have um, sort of intermediaries to talk to individuals inside Lebanon. Um, those are ongoing. I don't think it's productive for me to read them out publicly. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Harper, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, since Israel's killing of Hezbollah's leader, Nasrallah, in Lebanon, who also was the head of the UN agency, UNRWA Teachers Association of Lebanon, when did the United States know this, and what did the United States do about it? And have a follow-up. Uh, uh, what was the question with with respect to who, whom? Okay, Nasrallah. When a with Nasrallah. This. So with, with since respect Israel's to Israel's killing of a Hezbollah yeah. leader Nasrallah in Lebanon, who also was the head of the UN agency UNRWA Teachers Association of Lebanon. When did the United States so, know this, I, I, that's, and what that's, that's did the United why, States was, do about it? That's why I was con I was confused by the question. So with respect to Israel's killing, we did not know about it in advance. Okay, and, and is the United States aware of others on the UN agency UNRWA payroll today with similar standing in Hezbollah or other terror groups, and what is the United States doing about it? So we have made clear to UNRWA that anyone uh, uh, involved in a terrorist organization should not be on their payroll. UNRWA has made clear that they agree with that proposition. They have launched investigations when uh, serious allegations are brought to them. They have taken action um, uh, against allegations, and we have made clear that um, uh, we want to see funding restored to UNRWA, but it's important that when their allegations brought to 
their attention, they take action against them. Yeah. Um, let me do a few more on the Middle East, and I know I'll go to the the. Yeah, go ahead. I know I do, I do want it since I didn't I didn't have the chance to do it yesterday. But, but hold on, there's some because I we're 40 minutes into the briefing, and I've got no questions. I mean, it's been all the Middle East, and yesterday I got like two questions the rest of the world. I felt like I, I shortchanged people, so I, I want to make sure I have the chance to get to other things today. So go ahead. Do you have anything on the reports that suggesting Tehran has conducted its first ever atomic bomb test on October 5th? Uh, I do not have any information. I haven't seen that report, and I don't have any information to verify it. So, Extremely briefly on that, just, semi, not, not that yeah. topic, but related. Um, the last time we got an on-the-record update from the administration about the uh, status of the $6 billion that was uh, released from the South Korean uh, banks to Qatar was that the Iranians had not uh, gotten access to any of it. Is that still accurate? My uh, understanding is that remains the case. Can you, can I'll you check? check I'll check, but I've, I've not heard any. I have not heard any change in the disposition of those funds. Thank you, um, Brian, go ahead. Uh, Jack, did you have one more? Yeah, before? Brian, go ahead. So uh, the the August 2021 uh, drone strike in Kabul, as you know, if you recall, as the U.S. was leaving, we recently uh, interviewed the survivors who are now here in Kansas City who say they're pressing for compensation or some type of, they're in some type of negotiations with the State Department. Can you confirm that? Is there anything you can say about the status of, of compensating those survivors? I'd have to take it back. I'm not aware of, of um, uh, those conversations. If they are happening, I'd have to take it back and get more information. Okay. So I'm, ha I'm happy to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Another, another terrorist, I'll come to you next, Gita. Go. Another terrorist attack in Pakistan. This time, uh, a suicide bomber targeted Chinese engineers at Karachi Airport. Um, multiple deaths and injuries. Any thoughts? Uh, any condolences? Uh, yes, we condemn the deadly attack near Karachi's International Airport, and we are deeply saddened by the reported loss of life and injured victims. We extend our heartfelt uh, felt condolences to those impacted. So there are violent protests in Pakistan for the release of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Uh, in many cities, roads are blocked, there is no internet, no mobile phone service, um, and the State Department also issued a security alert for U.S. citizens in Pakistan. What are your thoughts on that? So in Pakistan, as around the world, we support freedom of expression, uh, peaceful assembly and association. We call on protesters to demonstrate peacefully and refrain from violence. And at the same time, we call on Pakistani authorities to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms and to ensure respect for Pakistan's law and laws and constitution and work to maintain law and order. So U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom just released a new report on India and asking State Department uh, to impose sanctions on some individuals and entities uh, and also designate India as CPC, any comments on that? Yeah, so I, we've, um, we've seen the report, uh, US uh, CIRF is an independent commission that provides policy recommendations to um, the executive branch as well as to Congress. It's not a part of the State Department or um, a part of the executive branch. I think as you know, at, after careful review in December of last year, the Secretary assessed that India did not meet the threshold for designation as a country of particular concern. Um, but we continue to carefully monitor the religious freedom situation in every country, including India. Gita, Gita, go ahead. A um, couple of questions on Afghanistan. This past Friday, it was reported that Russia has decided to remove the Taliban from the um, that countries from Russia's list of um, terrorist organizations. I was wondering if you have any comments, any thoughts on that. So, first of all, we have not changed our uh, designation of the Taliban as a specially designated global terrorist organization, um, and we continue to make clear that any significant steps towards normalization of relations uh, is contingent upon a profound shift in the Taliban's human rights conduct. Um, uh, and there has been remarkable unity among the international community on that question. Speaking of human rights, um, what, uh, concerning the rights of women and girls over there, um, seems like there is a global consensus. Um, but, well, um, what is the U.S.? Are you pushing further for any action in this regard? Yeah, we. So I would say that that when I say human rights are at the forefront of uh, our engagement with uh, the Taliban, that especially includes the rights of women and girls who continue to be oppressed by the Taliban. Um, we continue to work with our allies and partners to press the Taliban to reverse their discriminatory edicts and make sure that um, any step, we make sure that any significant steps toward normalization relations are contingent upon profound improvements in their treatment of women and girls, including, but not limited to, 
allowing women and girls back in school and lifting the restrictions on uh, women's employment. Um, the U.S. Uh, had a um, special envoy for Afghanistan, but Tom West has been removed to a different position. Um, does this change mean that Afghanistan and the issue relating to the Afghan people um, are not as important as previous? Not times? at all. All of the work that Tom West has been carrying out will be con will continue to be uh, carried out by our chief of mission, Karen Decker, by Special Envoy Amiri, and by uh, Ambassador Palmersheim, uh, the Deputy Central Sec uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central uh, uh, Asia. We will continue to, to carry forward all of those policy priorities with no one changes. Last one no on changes. This. Yeah, one last ahead. one, please. Um, Twenty three years ago, the U.S. began its military operations in Afghanistan against the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Now, 23 years later, the Taliban is back in power, and the UN reports that Al Qaeda is regrouping and is active there. To what extent uh, has the U.S. achieved its goals in S Afghanistan? So, our most critical interest when it comes to Afghanistan uh, has been and will continue to be that the country can never again be a launching pad for terrorist attacks against the United States. And we continue to remain incredibly vigilant against any terrorist threats directed to the United States and its allies. And as you've heard us say, as, you, as you've seen us demonstrate before, we maintain the, the capabilities to um, ensure that the United States is protected in that regard, including when it comes to Afghanistan. Janie, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I said on ASEAN meeting, the arms trade between North Korea and Russia continues. And the UN Security Council has not been able to resolve this issue. Will this issue and the North Korean nuclear issue be discussed at the upcoming ASEAN meeting? Yes, I, you, I think you can expect that the Secretary will raise um, the concerning uh, deepening partnership between Russia and North Korea in his engagements while in Laos. One more kick uh, at the UN Security Council, North Korea's representative said North Korea was a nuclear state and would not engage in any dialogue or bargaining to denuclearize. What are the expectations of the United States regarding North Korea's denuclearization and what are the alternatives? We remain fully committed to the, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Yeah. Alex, go ahead. A couple of questions staying on the topic, on the trip. Uh, can you just clarify whether or not the Ramstein and summit will take place at all? Are you guys sending someone else? So I would defer to the White House to speak to that question. It was a organi presidentially organized trip. The, pre the secretary was going to uh, accompany the president and now is returning home. Thank you. In your opening statement, you said that Ukraine will be discussed among other, other topics uh, during the secretary's meetings. To what level uh, it will be discussed? And is there anything you expect from ASEAN uh, members? It will be discussed at the secretary's level. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, it, well, <laughs> I don't know what, how to answer that question. It's, it's I mean, the secretary is conducting the meeting, so it'll be discussed at his yeah, level. I, I get that. Not I, trying I, to fair, be flippant, but. Fair, fair point. But <laughs> what decision do you expect from ASEAN members? What they have, they can do that they have not done yet. So we will continue to urge every country in the world to fully support Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and its sovereignty, and to make clear that every country should recognize that in this war, Russia is the aggressor and Ukraine is the victim. Thank you. I know South Korea is on them, but they, they will be there. And they mentioned today that North Korea likely is sending soldiers to Ukraine uh, to aid uh, Russia, basically uh, sell it, sending them to actually have Russia inside Ukraine. Do you have any reaction? I don't have any assessment to offer and on that. Today, Simon, uh, let me, Simon, Ukraine, I got I got to move on because we're uh, almost out of time. Simon, go ahead. Question. Yeah. Um, I don't, would the secretary have an opportunity to meet with any uh, Cambodian officials during that trip? And um, specifically wondered if, he, if there would be an opportunity to raise the case of the journalist Mick Dora, who's uh, been arrested for over a week now. Um, and uh, is, was a recipient of a, of a TIP award from the secretary last year. So I don't have any um, uh, meetings to preview today. As I said, in response to Matt's question, we'll make the meetings public as the, the trip goes on. Um, but we are deeply troubled by the arrest of uh, internationally respected journalist Mek Dara. We have already raised this directly with the Cambodian government um, and uh, encouraged them to engage with diverse voices and opinions and foster a free and independent press. And we have made quite clear uh, our concerns over this arrest.
Um, I'll say we've yeah, the same thing, exact same thing that you said last week when I asked you about this. Is there, yeah, but he was, there any, he, he was I know, asking I know, me. If I know, did, but I just want to no, know: is there any change to it? Because I I don't have it. I no, can't pull it up. No, she's not been released. But that is that's hey. that's that is. That is that is our position. No, We've no, raised no, it no. already I mean, multiple levels. Good. I, I get that, but but what you just said, is there any change in what you just said to what you I what you had tell said you if last week? Word for word, but um, that has right. been our position. Can, yeah, can since you she say was arrested. Anything about what the the Cambodian response has been? Have they have they explained the arrest at all to you? No, they should speak for themselves. I'm not going to speak to the the private diplomatic conversation, but I'll say in our calls we made clear our concerns with her arrest and underscored that uh, journalists should be able to um, uh, conduct journalism. Uh, Without fear of reprisal. His, his arrest. His arrest. Excuse and, me. Sorry, um, sorry. Is there? Uh, he had been reporting on these scam centers in Southeast Asia, particularly, um, and you guys did some sanctions last month against the Cambodian tycoon Lee Yong Pat. Um, have you have you got any suggestion or, or managed to gather any any information that uh, this arrest could be linked to some of his reporting specifically on on that tycoon? Uh, I just don't want to speak to the private diplomatic conversations. Matt, um, Matt, uh, go ahead. Thanks. So uh, Israel is still poised to strike Iran, and in July, Blinken said that Iran was one to two weeks away from developing a nuclear weapon. So. I guess for all we know, they might have one by now. And meanwhile, in Ukraine, they've struck deep within Russian territory several times, as deep as 300 miles from the border. And in that case, we don't have to guess. We know that Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal on the planet, as many as 6,000 warheads. And so one of the risks of arming militaries that are striking in the territories of nuclear powers is that one, one of those gets deployed and then it could escalate very quickly from there. So it, it's rarely discussed, but it's important to address that the nuclear risk is real and it could very abruptly mean the end of you know what humans have worked for thousands of years to collectively achieve and uh, us today are very lucky to live in with the fruits of that achievement and i feel like we're treating the risks kind of brazenly so my question for you is you know we often hear in response to these concerns that well putin khomeini you know they're war criminals they're terrorists uh, as if they're too inherently evil or immoral for us to negotiate with but Meanwhile, this administration has financed a genocide in Gaza for the last year, and every day you're up there denying accountability for it. So, I mean, okay. what gives you the right to lecture other countries on their moral? So, if you have a policy question for me, I'm happy to take it. If you want to give a speech, no, but there are plenty I mean, of places in Washington where you can give a speech. Yeah, but people are, are sick of the bullshit in here. I mean, like, it is okay. a genocide. I'm gonna you go are abetting it, another question. and you go are ahead. risking well, nuclear war in Ukraine plenty, for this plenty proxy Plenty of other places to give a speech. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Bangladesh is moving forward under the leadership of Interim Government Chief Nobel Laureate. Professor Muhammad Yunus, after dictator Hasina, fled to India following mass killings and atrocities. Secretary Blinken had a productive meeting with Professor Yunus, and President Biden had an opportunity to meet Dr. Yunus on the sidelines of the UNGA, ANGA. Could you please share insight on the how the Biden administration is navigating its relationship <coughs> with Bangladesh, considering the country's challenges with economic stability, democracy, security, and Rohingya refugees, and one follow-up. So, so we continue to work with the the, bank, the government of Bangladesh on all those questions. The, sec the secretary did have a productive meeting um, uh, with the advisor to the interim government and looks forward to continued uh, engagement to advance uh, progress on all these issues. Indian External Affairs Minister was in this building last week. I'm wondering if anything regarding Bangladesh was discussed during his meeting with Secretary Blinken, given that Bangladesh's former dictator Hasina is in India and is allegedly trying to destabilize the country from Indian territory. Uh, I can tell you that um, regional issues, including B Bangladesh, often come up in our meetings with the government of India, but I don't have any specific readout to offer. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Kobe Potashman from Medill News Service. Uh, this is on Israel. It's been a year since October 7th. You've, uh, we've already been asked what the end game is in the region. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that Israel is its own sovereign country. You said last week the United States will work to advance its own interests. Um, five American citizens have been killed in it by Israel in the region in the past year, one in Gaza, three in the West Bank, and one in Lebanon. You're obviously working to evacuate Americans, but the highway has been bombed on um, I would imagine even if it isn't anymore, that's probably a bit of a deterrent, people trying to drive to the airport. Um, so just 
broadly speaking, what actually are the United States' own sovereign interests here? And do they include or do they supersede the deaths of American citizens? We want to see uh, full investigations into the deaths of any American citizens. We want to see uh, accountability when accountability is merited. And ultimately, when the, you look at the policy goals, we want to see a, a stable Middle East um, with relations between Israel and its neighbors with the establishment of an independent Palestinian state and broad peace and security across the region. Go ahead. Have really Thank you very much. No, go ahead. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, but, but a lot of was said about uh, 1701, United Nations resolution about Lebanon. Uh, on April 21st, 1948, there was a re resolution as well, uh, uh, which was called the uh, resolution number 47 about Kashmir, the Indian held Kashmir, where uh, Modi uh, a few years ago, changed the laws. Anyway, just recently elections were held and uh, his opposition won. Um, how do you see this? Is the plebiscite uh, resolution is going to be implemented ever or no? Uh, so we, um, free and fair elections are the cornerstone of a thriving democracy, and when it comes to these elections, we don't take a position on any party or candidate. Uh, one uh, more thing. Um, just for your interest, uh, at the age of 15, I met Prime Minister Bhutto here in California for the first time. Uh, my family relationship have been with People's Party a lot, but the way Imran Khan and his whole party has been treated since last two years, it's been very horrible. And it's only for democracy and human rights that issue that I've been raised with you. Now his two sisters are even arrested, who have nothing to do with politics. Uh, Anything louder uh, you can speak uh, about uh, just the situation overall in Pakistan? Ult ultimately, these are questions for the government of Pakistan. Just Hiba, did you, but let me, just I'm going to move on. We've been on for all. Hiba, Hiba, do you have anything important. else? And then we're going to wrap. Go just ahead. a follow-up on uh, just uh, some media is reporting now that uh, Israel has set conditions for accepting discussions on a ceasefire in Lebanon. This is uh, French diplomatic sources to some media. So do you have anything to comment? So I am going to abide by the rule I set on my very first day at this podium, which is news that breaks while I'm at the podium and I haven't had a chance to fully digest or, or understand the context I'm not going to comment on from here. So I apologize for that. And that will wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Jeez.